Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 186 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. As a result of Great Britain's victory in the Seven Years' War, British North America grew so that it stretched from the Atlantic coast west to the Mississippi River and from Hudson Bay in the Gulf of St. Lawrence south to Florida. Plus, it also included islands in the Caribbean. So how exactly would Great Britain, centered on a small little island, manage and govern such a vast expanse of territory, which was located over 3,000 miles away? This is essentially what King George III and his Privy Council asked the Board of Trade after they signed the Treaty of Paris in 1763. So. What kind of imperial management plan did the Board of Trade develop for Great Britain's North American colonies? And what role did this plan play in the development of the British Empire in North America after 1763? To answer these questions, we need to turn to Max Edelson, because the Board of Trade's ideas and solutions for the better management of British North America are the subject of his book, The New Map of Empire, How Britain Imagined America Before Independence. Now, As we explore the Board of Trade's plan for British North America, we'll discover details about the size of the British Empire after the Seven Years' War, King George III's order to the Board of Trade and its response to that order, and information about the General Survey of North America and how the Board of Trade envisioned surveys and maps as the key to Great Britain's better management of its North American colonies. But first, did you know there's still time to take my listener survey? Knowing what you think about the show is very helpful to me and the Omohundro Institute because we want you to enjoy this podcast and our weekly explorations of early American history. The survey will take just a few minutes of your time, and if you take it, you'll be eligible to join our drawing for a signed copy of some really great books about early American history. You can take the survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. All right. Are you ready to discover the evolution of Great Britain's plans to better manage its North American colonies? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an associate professor of history at the University of Virginia. His research seeks to describe the material and cultural dimensions of New World colonization. He's the director of the Map Scholar Project and the author of two books, Plantation Enterprise in Colonial South Carolina, and his latest book, The New Map of Empire, How Britain Imagined America Before Independence. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Max Edelson. Thank you very much, Liz. I'm happy to be here. Now, in The New Map of Empire, Max seeks to explore how Great Britain sought to manage its greatly expanded empire in North America and the Caribbean after 1763. Max, as you know, This expansion of the British Empire came as a result of British victory during the Seven Years or French and Indian War. And I wonder if you would tell us what the state of the British Empire was after this war. I mean, just how big did the British Empire become by 1763? So this is the great transformation that my book explores. After the Seven Years' War, after the Treaty of Paris, North America stretched from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River and from Hudson Bay in the north all the way to the Floridas, and included new Caribbean islands as well. All that had been the colony of New France was now regarded by Great Britain as the British colony of Quebec. Spanish Florida, which had occupied much of the southeast for 200 years, was now two British colonies, East Florida on the peninsula and West Florida along the Gulf Coast. In the Caribbean, there were four new islands that became British colonies, Dominica, St. Vincent, Grenada, and Tobago. These were known collectively as the ceded islands because they were ceded by the Treaty of Paris that ended the war. And finally, the lands in and around the Gulf of St. Lawrence, a region we now know as Atlantic Canada, became British as well. But there was an exception. There were two tiny islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, St. Pierre and Miquelon. These were reserved to France to make it possible for French fishermen to dry their catches 
they still had treaty rights under the Treaty of 1763 to fish in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and they remain French territory to this day. So in terms of sheer territories, acres, number of colonies, this was a dramatic expansion for the British Empire in America. So the British Empire actually became a whole lot bigger as a result of the Seven Years' War, which raises the question, how did Great Britain, how did King George III and Parliament manage all of this territory? Right. So there was a great celebration that Britain had won the war. It was a great moment of British patriotism that was celebrated in print and in text and even on new maps that were produced. The map I work the most with is a map by Emmanuel Bowen. It's called An Accurate Map of North America. It revises an earlier map to show just the grandeur and extent of this new empire. And the map maker, Emmanuel Bowen, and his engraver, John Gibson, literally engraved the terms of the Treaty of Paris across the surface of this map. So the first impulse from the British after the war was celebration and a desire to kind of hold up the grandeur of this new massive empire for the world to see. But there was also some concern about what it would mean to govern this vast space. Of course, all this new territory meant that Britain would have to pay to defend and develop this vast empire. One of the solutions to that problem was new taxes on the colonies to pay for thousands of new troops who would live in these frontier forts at the remote edges of British America. And that, as we know, created real problems that led to the American Revolution. But it also provided an opportunity to reform the way empire worked, to reform the way colonies develop, and to tighten up the bonds of colonial governments to kind of set the whole empire on the right path. So there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of concern about how this place would be developed. So as much grandeur as people chose to admire in this new map, there was also a great deal of fear. And one of the key fears was a fear that the colonies were growing too fast and too out of control to be governed, and that they would someday become independent. So there's kind of a A darker story to this moment of triumph, where a lot of British officials are concerned about colonial independence and are really eager to secure colonial dependence and to do so at this moment after the war, once this new empire is formed. You know, I recognize something interesting when I read Max's book, The New Map of Empire. And that's when, when we think of this post Seven Years War period, our minds often immediately jump to events like the Stamp Act Crisis of 1765 or the Boston Massacre of 1770 or to any of the other events that we now associate with the American Revolution. But there was actually an intervening step between the end of the war and the revolution. Before Parliament and King George III started passing all of those revenue acts that we now associate with the revolution's protests, King George III actually sent a far different set of instructions to his government on how he wanted to handle and manage the colonies. In 1763, after the signing of the Treaty of Paris, King George III and his Privy Council charged the Board of Trade to figure out how to better manage the empire's North American possessions. So Max, would you tell us about this Board of Trade and how it responded to this order from King George III and his Privy Council? So the Board of Trade is really the central agent in my book and in this story. And I think you're right. We have to begin the story of how we get to the American Revolution, not at the Stamp Act, but really at the end of the Seven Years' War, as Britain looked to this new empire and tried to figure out how to manage it and how to improve it. So as I mentioned before, 1763 provided a real opportunity to turn what many British officials had long regarded as the chaos of the colonial world into a more orderly system. It was an opportunity to create a real empire that was centralized, that was rational, that balanced the interests of all the subjects of the king in a way that hopefully made everyone happy and prosperous, and especially an empire that would bolster British power in the world on a kind of permanent basis. The irony of the Seven Years' War is that Britain waged this immense war for empire. It cost an enormous amount in blood and treasure, But there was no clear plan for the peace until after that peace was secured. So once the negotiators were done and all these new territories had been added to the empire, the Board of Trade was asked by the king and the Privy Council to create a plan for the peace, which they did in a document that the Board of Trade sent to the king on June 8th, 1763. This document is called the Report on Acquisitions in America. If you've never heard of it, that's okay. You're not alone. I hadn't heard of it either before I started this research. 
although it's a very little known text today, it is really the key blueprint for Britain's plan for America. And it was not only an extensive text that discussed the purpose of empire and how each of these new colonies should be settled and governed and how the whole system of British America and the British Atlantic should be regulated. It also had an illustration, the very map I mentioned before, Emmanuel Bowen's An Accurate Map of North America. This map created to celebrate Britain's victory in the New World that was published and widely purchased in Britain. The Board of Trade also bought a copy of this map, and across its surface, they annotated by hand with pen and ink the new territories that Britain had added to the empire, how their boundaries should be developed. And it was really an illustration so the king could see with his own eyes how this empire would come together and what it would look like. Together, this text and this map became a blueprint for a perfected empire that Britain tried to impose in the generation before the American Revolution. It sounds to me like the Board of Trade started with Bowen's map and then became obsessed with maps. Because one of its answers to how do we better organize British North America was to survey all of its colonies in North America and the Caribbean. And I wonder, why do you think the Board of Trade responded to King George that if we're to better govern the colonies, then we need to survey them and produce more maps. The Board of Trade had been instituted long before this series of controversies came up. It was formally formed by King William in 1696. And like many other rising European states with rising empires to manage, governments were becoming more systematic with the way they dealt with information. So the Board of Trade was one of a number of committees or agencies that were tasked with collecting data in the same year that the Board of Trade was formed, 1696, Britain formally began collecting import and export data so it could know how much these colonies were worth and how much they might be able to tax them. So the board became a clearinghouse for information about the colonies, its commissioners, this group of well-placed noblemen who ran the Board of Trade and their clerks. They corresponded with colonial governors. They collected that correspondence. And one of their charges was to collect and produce maps. And you can see the practical need for this. I mean, if you're a member of the Board of Trade and the governor of Jamaica has sent you a letter, you might not know enough about Jamaican geography to really follow along. So it would be handy to have a collection of maps, the best maps that could be purchased or made that could inform decisions made about these colonies. So since 1696, the Board of Trade had been collecting maps. It had started producing maps. And it thought that maps were an indispensable tool to govern this empire. At the same time, it had this critique of American colonies. The Board of Trade was really the center of a group of British thinkers who thought that Americans were selfish and irresponsible. They looked at histories of fraud and violence, especially in the Indian trade, of inadequate supplies of men and materiel in time of war. And they were really keen to get rid of proprietorships and take charge of the colonies. And they, you know, from an American perspective, this looks at a kind of tyranny that would be criticized by patriots during the American Revolutionary War. But in writing this book, I started to see a little bit their side of the story. They thought they were reformers who were going to make this empire better for everyone, make it obviously better for Britain and its wealth, but also for the people who lived in the colonies, that if it was a better regulated empire, it could be a more effective empire. So this is a long way of talking about the way maps became central to its mission. Early modern states like Great Britain's were a lot less powerful and less intrusive than governments are today. They just didn't have the capacity to control life on the ground very much, even in England, much less America. But what they did have in America was a legal title to all of this new territory, all of this land. And in their view, the key to controlling how these new societies in places like West Florida and Quebec would develop and grow was to regulate how the land was granted, to figure out who to give it to and on what terms they would get it. So to shape this new empire was really important for officials on the Board of Trade to understand the distant lands of North America and the Caribbean. And maps seemed to be the answer to that problem. The maps that were produced in this era, the maps that my book studies, are rigorous military-style maps that pictured the land in very high resolution, usually one or two inches to the mile at the highest resolution. And these were maps that allowed you to see the shape of the topography, the mountains and rivers, the types of land was often divided into swampland and highland and arable farmland. 
Even the boundaries of individual tracts of property were visible on these new maps of empire. So the Board of Trade doubled down on map making at this moment when it wanted to take new control of the colonies. And it did so using these maps as a window to this distant world. If they could see the new lands of North America and the West Indies, then they could control how they developed. At least that was the plan. The Board of Trade sounds like it was really an advisory body, like a clearinghouse for the information that it collected and solicited so that it had this information on hand when King and Parliament asked for it. And it also sounds like it had some administrative responsibilities, but like King and Parliament had the final say on all colonial administration. Very much so. So my book is a bit distinctive in that most historians have disregarded the influence of the Board of Trade. There was a time in the 1740s and 1750s when prominent leaders of the Board of Trade, like the Earl of Halifax, tried to enhance the powers of the board so that they would have formal executive authority to appoint governors and take matters into their own hands. Those bids didn't really work very well. And so most historians have really seen the Board of Trade as as irrelevant. But as we know today, information really is power. And the Board of Trade didn't have a lot of formal power. But when the king and the Privy Council asked for information, the Board of Trade really had control over that information. And the way they presented and gathered information and proposed solutions to policy problems relating to the Americas was incredibly influential. And one of the things I studied for this book was what happened when the Board of Trade made recommendations to the Privy Council? Well, in almost all cases, and especially in 1763, there were a few small amendments and corrections. But largely, the Privy Council and the King rubber stamped what the Board of Trade proposed. So the Board of Trade, especially during peacetime, had enormous influence in these councils of state to shape a vision for development that policy and parliament and the King followed as a kind of plan for development. During wartime, however, the Board of Trade's authority really plummeted. The Board of Trade kind of became as irrelevant as historians have suspected during the wartime periods. But it was after the peace was forged that the Board of Trade's power and control over information, geographic information in particular, became a real asset and allowed them to impose and shape policy. Now, what about the Board of Trade's general survey? They conducted it at the end of the French and Indian War. And I wonder if you would tell us about the scope of this survey, what kind of work went into conducting this survey, how many surveys did it entail, how many maps did it yield? And, you know... Perhaps if we need a case study to answer all of these questions, you could tell us about Samuel Holland and his survey of St. John and the Canadian Maritimes. So the General Survey of North America was a Board of Trade controlled survey that was divided into two survey districts. Samuel Holland, a military captain and engineer during the Seven Years' War, was appointed as the Northern Surveyor General. And William de Brahm, another military officer who had had some wartime experience, was appointed the Surveyor General of the Southern District. And I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the Gulf of St. Lawrence, but I think it's important to understand that these two surveys, although really important, were part of a group of surveys that the Board of Trade kind of managed from London. The Admiralty had its own surveyors, especially along the Gulf Coast, around West Florida, New Orleans, all the way to the Gulf side of the peninsula of East Florida. The Army was doing surveys in the far west as it settled to new frontier forts. There was a new commission that parceled out all the land in the Caribbean. And the superintendents for Indian affairs had their own surveyors to measure out the new boundaries between Indian nations and the colonies. So the Board of Trade was really at the epicenter of a whole series of linked surveys that included the General Survey of North America. But we know a lot about the General Survey of North America And in particular, we know a lot about how Samuel Holland and his assistant surveyors surveyed the lands and islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In part, we know a lot about this because the best body of maps from sketchbooks all the way to finished published images have survived. So we can trace the evolution of map making. In terms of the broader question of how many maps were produced during this moment, it was certainly hundreds, if not thousands of maps. But one of the things that it was hard for me to do as a researcher was to locate all these maps and figure out an answer to that question, just how many maps were there. Originally in my research, I had the bold idea that I was going to collect and create a bibliography, at least, of all of the maps that I could find. 
this became really impossible. There was just so many maps to sort through. And one of the problems that Britain had with managing all of this information was that after the maps were made, the idea behind them was that they would be deposited in London. They would be the maps that would form a great imperial archive that British officials could use in a really flexible, innovative way to respond to events on the ground. But in fact, this never came to pass. Britain really lacked the administrative capacity to manage all this information. So they had great maps, but they really didn't know what to do with them. And there's an example of this I mentioned in the book. So one of the big surveying expeditions was in the new Caribbean colonies in the Ceded Islands. And once all the land had been sold as plantation tracts, the government closed down the land office in Dominica in 1774. But they didn't make any provision for the maps that this survey had collected. And the chief surveyor in Dominica was a Scotsman named Alexander Forbes. So he asked the governor, well, what should I do with all these maps? And there was no answer to this question. No provision had been made for them. No one seemed to want them. So he kept them himself. He allowed local planters to consult them. No one asked for them in London. So I think we get the difference between the vision of a grand imperial archive filled with all of these wonderful maps and then the reality of a British state that was really quite shorthanded and had bitten off far more than it could chew in terms of processing this information. So what that means for my work is that I don't know how many maps there were because these maps drifted off. Many of them ended up in private collections. Some of the official maps ended up at the British Library and the National Archives of the United Kingdom. The Library of Congress has a large collection of them, but so does the Clements Library at the University of Michigan and the Huntington Library in California, and the National Archive of Canada. So my goal as a historian was to try to create a representative sample of this moment in map making. I wasn't going to be able to talk about all the maps or even find them. But what I did do is create a sample of 257 maps and map collections so that people could get a sense, so readers and viewers of the website could get a sense of the variety, the range, and the qualities of these maps. Yeah, that's something that's really unique about your book, because it's a book about maps that doesn't actually contain any images of maps in it. Instead, you've placed all the maps you've collected online through your app called Map Scholar. So would you tell us more about Map Scholar and your decision to place all the maps you discuss in your book online? Yeah, when the vision for this book came together, I was a fellow at the Library of Congress, and I started looking through the manuscript maps in their collections and really began noticing something that I didn't expect. I expected to see tons of maps of the most populous and valuable places in British America, places like Jamaica, Philadelphia, Massachusetts, South Carolina. And there were some maps of those places, but there were far more maps of these new territories, places like Pensacola in West Florida or the island of St. Vincent, tons and tons of maps and charts of Nova Scotia. And I'd studied these places as a graduate student, But unlike South Carolina, the subject of my first book, and some of the other major colonies, I didn't really have a clear grasp of the histories of these places, these kind of marginal places. I knew where they were. I could find them on a map, but I didn't know much about their histories. And it became clear to me that the maps that Britain was making, even of very different places, as different as Nova Scotia and Grenada, had something in common. They were part of a common imperial project. So my book, became an effort to understand that common project. And when I told my editor about this idea, she said, that's terrific, but we can only afford to print maybe 15, 20 maps in the book. Well, I was thinking of hundreds of maps, not 10 or 20 maps. So as soon as I started understanding what this book would be, as soon as I had a vision for how the book would be shaped around these maps, I had to think of another way of showing readers these maps. And I started getting involved in digital humanities development. The National Endowment for the Humanities had a digital startup grant program, which really allowed people who didn't have any experience with digital humanities, but maybe a good idea, to begin experimenting with methods. And I got one of those grants and began experimenting with how to put maps, how to georeference them, show them on a base map, what computer tools existed to do this. And as I collected maps in my research, I put them online to try to visualize them, to try to work with them myself. When I moved to the University of Virginia, We have a really storied series of institutes that work on digital humanities. I began working with Shanti, an institute here that's focused on digital humanities, and the visualization specialist, Bill Furster. Many of you will probably know Bill's work because he was one of the people that developed the software that allowed Ken Burns to 
pan and scan across all of those photographs and images in the Civil War series and other documentaries. So between the two of us, we got a new NEH grant. We spent three years and enlisted a lot of graduate students and other experts to help us build Map Scholar so that there would be no limit to how I and other scholars interested in cartography could display maps online. And this tool also gives us a lot of flexibility in the way we show maps. We can zoom in on the details that I mentioned in the text, and we can do so in high resolution, you know, without any limit on the number of maps we could include. So as we develop this digital humanities resource, I really reimagined the book. It wasn't going to be like a traditional book. I certainly didn't want to produce a coffee table sized book with lots of color images. I use many of these books and they're quite beautiful, but I thought that that would really limit the readership for this book. So I don't know if it's going to be something that other historians pick up on as they study map history. But for me, building a website and having it linked up with the book was a solution to the problem of how to do this kind of imperial history and how to do this kind of map history. Okay. So before we dive into exploring the impact of these general survey maps and how the Board of Trade actually implemented the information it collected, I'd like for us to get into the nuts and bolts of how the Board of Trade collected information for the general survey. But first, we should talk about our episode sponsor. The Omohundro Institute has been the proud publisher of award-winning books since 1943. And one of the Omohundro Institute's most recent publications is Molly Warsh's American Baroque, Pearls in the Nature of Empire, 1492 to 1700. Published in partnership with the University of North Carolina Press, this book takes a deep dive into Spain's exploitation of Caribbean pearl fisheries to trace the origins of Spain's maritime empire. Warsh demonstrates how in the 1500s, the legal and illegal trades in pearls gave rise to global networks and connected the Caribbean to both the Indian Ocean and the pearl-producing regions of the Chesapeake and Northern Europe. Even as they were traded, pearls defied easy categorization. People coveted them, but they didn't always tax or value pearls as a luxury good. Instead, pearls served as a symbol of status, which people all along the economic spectrum wore and traded. In many ways, pearls stood as a symbol of their imperial time. They connected people through a network of new shores and also caused violence in disputed territories. Intrigued? Would you like to read more about pearls in early America? Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash pearls to discover more. And if you like what you see, be sure to use the promo code at the top of the page to receive a special 40% discount. Again, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash pearls. Max, we keep talking about surveys, but we've yet to actually discuss how they were conducted. Would you tell us about William de Brom or Samuel Holland and the work they put into making their surveys for the Board of Trade? So when Samuel Holland was appointed Surveyor General for the Northern District of North America, he was tasked with a very specific survey mission. The island of St. John, one of the large islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, it's since been renamed Prince Edward Island. This was the focus of Britain's colonizing efforts in the Northern District. The goal of this survey, which was the first thing Samuel Holland was supposed to do when he arrived in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 1765, was to map every inch of the island of St. John and prepare it to be divided up so that it could be given to investors as townships. And these investors would be tasked with bringing people and developing each of these vast townships. So the reason this is such an important place is not only because Britain made it a priority in the years immediately following the war, but because the best maps have survived for St. John. I looked high and low for the original sketch maps that these surveyors had produced, but these surveyors didn't regard their sketchbooks as really valuable. I imagine that once they made their copies from the sketchbooks, many of them probably threw away their sketchbooks. They weren't really valuable records. But the public record office at Prince Edward Island owns the only copy of an original sketchbook from this era that I've been able to find. It was the sketchbook of assistant surveyor Thomas Wright. And what it shows is the progress of his survey of one part of the island of St. John over the summer of 1765. And what it is, is a series of coastlines that are created by using what was called plain table survey. So plain table surveying was the dominant method for doing a rigorous coastal survey really up through the early 20th century before the advent of aerial photography changed coastal surveying. And the way it worked was you would set up a plane table, which was basically a tripod with a writing surface on top. 
And that writing surface would have a piece of paper. You would also have a special telescope called an allidate. And the principle of plane table surveying is that you measured simply one distance with a chain so that you had a really accurate baseline from which to base the survey. Everything else about the survey involved taking the plane table and pointing at a distant object from one point along that measured distance, and then moving the whole plane table with its telescope to the other end of that chain, and then examining that same object from another position. By doing that in a systematic way, surveyors used mathematics, triangulation, in order to create a series of triangles across the landscape that would give an accurate sense of the shape of a coastline. So as you can imagine, if you're in St. John Island in the summer, it might be kind of nice, although I imagine there's a lot of mosquitoes there. But these surveys went on through the winter and surveyors died during the survey. In fact, Peter Frederick Haldeman, one of the surveyors of the Northern District, when he was surveying on nearby Cape Breton Island in 1765, he actually fell through the ice and died. So this involved all of these surveyors and their assistants and cadets out on the landscape conducting these surveys. And by my calculations from Thomas Wright's sketchbook, they basically surveyed about seven miles of coastline per day. So if you can imagine the vast distances of all these new territories, surveying was dangerous, difficult, and expensive work and involved actually traversing the landscape in order to produce these sketches that were then formed into the maps that became used by the British government. What was important about this for the mission that Britain had for its maps was that they didn't just want a picture of the landscape, they wanted an assessment of it. They wanted a sense of the type of land, the quality of the land, what it could be good for, what kind of crops would grow in the soil. And these surveyors spent a lot of time on the landscape in different seasons. And so in addition to a picture of the island of St. John, Samuel Holland collected all of the remarks of his surveyors as they talked about which land seemed especially good and which land seemed especially poor. This was the kind of geographic information that Britain used in order to parcel out this land and develop these tracts of land so that they could develop a new kind of colony that they could control directly. Now, although the Board of Trade had dispatched surveyors to North America, the king didn't always wait for them to finish or really even get started with their work before he used information to mark and divide North American lands. Max, would you tell us about the Proclamation Line of 1763 and how that line reflected the larger general survey and Great Britain's plans to use these surveys and the information they contained to govern North America? What historians now call the Proclamation Line was first suggested by the Board of Trade as part of its general plan for empire. So the king and the Privy Council endorsed it as part of the Board of Trade's vision. And of course, the idea of this line was that there should be an end to empire and colonization from North American colonies into the West in order to create a stable space for Native nations. One of the big critiques that the Board of Trade had had of the colonies to that point was that colonists were so aggressive about expanding into Western lands that they used the treaty process to commit frauds against Native Americans, that this whole process was not only illegal in their eyes, but it produced enormous violence on the frontier. Britain had just fought a great war for empire. One of the key factors in the victory was winning over some of the Native Americans who had been fighting against Great Britain. And so they wanted to sustain that peaceful relationship that had been cultivated, at least with some Native nations during the war. So the goal was to set the minds of Native peoples at ease and to convince them that Britain didn't want their lands, that there would be an end to colonization into Native territories. So this vision was something the Board of Trade drew across the map that they submitted to the king. And the red line they drew across this map was the first vision of what a proclamation line could look like. In reality, however, the proclamation line, although it looks good in a U.S. history textbook, didn't really exist as a real boundary. The proclamation line is a term that contemporaries didn't use at all. It's something that historians have used to describe it. The Board of Trade's line across the mountains indicated a kind of idea of what should be native territory and what should be colonial territory. But all of these mountainous lands in the Appalachians were unsurveyed. And where this line actually was, was really anyone's guess. If you zoom in on Emmanuel Bowen's map, the map that the Board of Trade drew this line across, You'll notice that as you get into the mountains, you know, it looks like mountains from a distance. But once you zoom in, you'll see that it's just an icon of the same mountain printed again and again. 
Emmanuel Bowen didn't know, and nor did anyone know, the real topography of this mountain terrain. And so any line drawn across this map really didn't mean much. So in my book, I call this phase of thinking about the Indian boundary the imaginary line. It was the idea of a separate space for Native and colonial people, and that's what mattered. In the years that followed, Great Britain and its superintendents for Indian affairs and representatives from Native nations in North America convened a series of meetings that were called Congresses. There were a dozen of these Congresses between 1763 and 1775. And one of the key purposes of these diplomatic meetings was in each place with each nation to set a permanent negotiated boundary between the colonies on the eastern seaboard and the native nations. This line was, I think, the line that mattered. It's what I call in my book, the negotiated line. And it was intended to recognize Indian nations as sovereign spaces within the British Empire. Those who were behind it wanted to freeze the colonies where they were and create these stable spaces for indigenous societies where Indians wouldn't feel that they were always looking over their shoulder, that they would be peaceful participants in a larger British empire. The proclamation line, or the idea of a proclamation line, raises a really interesting question. We know that the Board of Trade conducted these surveys and that they had real and imaginary ideas of what the limits on colonization should be. But how did Native Americans understand and respond to the maps Great Britain created and to all those British surveyors who must have been trespassing on their land to conduct these surveys? So it's never a good idea to generalize about what Indians thought in North America because these were separate groups of people. Some of them shared common languages. Some of them considered each other rivals and adversaries. And so each of these groups came to treaty negotiations with the British with different objectives. And all of them welcomed this process for what it might promise, that is, an end to encroachment on Native lands. But most Indian negotiators were skeptical, maybe even more realistic and skeptical than the British members of the Board of Trade who were promoting this vision. They believed that this was an important moment to create good relations with Great Britain. Each of them had something to get out of it, hopefully better trade relations, an end to encroachment on their lands. But all of them, I think, also understood that the forces of settler colonialism were very powerful. And so they approached these negotiations with caution. When Native Americans made their own maps, they had a very different sense of space compared to the traditions of Western European map making. One of the maps I examine in the book is a map that the Catawba Indians presented to the governor of South Carolina in the early 1720s. And it's not a map that really attempts to depict landforms realistically. It's a map that pictures societies, groups of people, towns as circles and squares and connects those circles and squares with double lines that represent paths. The idea of the path is really critical in Native American thinking about space. The path symbolizes literal roads that connect places to one another. The path symbolizes good relations. And when Native Americans spoke with the British and others about making peace or making war, they talked about the path, that the path had been bloodied by conflict and needed to be whitened or cleaned by negotiation. And so Indians had a really clear sense of the way they wanted this world to look, and they influenced the way the British drew these maps of the boundary line. One of the most amazing things to me about this process is that it was really a collaborative process. So the British and Native nations agreed on where the boundary would go. And so a lot of these diplomatic proceedings that have survived to document these moments are basically just geographical recitations. The line should cross this river, and it should end up at this trading post, and it should follow the boundary of this mountain. But once that was agreed upon in the abstract, a surveyor was commissioned. And not only did representatives of the colony that was going to be affected by the Indian boundary line produce this survey, Indian representatives took part in the survey. They accompanied the surveyors to make sure that the line conformed to what they expected at the Congresses. One of the great complaints by Native Americans is that what they understood to have been agreed to at some of these earlier diplomatic meetings was not actually followed in practice. They felt they had been swindled by negotiators who took advantage of their lack of familiarity with European maps. So the British, by inviting Native Americans to actually survey the line with European surveyors, 
took advantage of the really developed oral networks that processed information in Indian country. The goal was to have these representatives actually see with their own eyes where these lines would be drawn and then to report back to people that, yes, indeed, the British had established the line. They saw it marked and they agreed to it. Sometimes native surveyors disagreed with the way European surveyors wanted to draw the line. So there was a chance to actually influence. So this is really a great project, a very idealistic project that imagined a very different world from the one we actually got in U.S. history, a world in which there would be some kind of equipoise, some stability between Native people and European people. But as we know, this vision was much easier to imagine than it was to actually put into practice. As Max mentioned earlier, the Board of Trade conducted surveys of mainland North America, the Canadian Maritimes, Florida, and the Ceded Islands. Those islands in the Caribbean that Great Britain had acquired as a result of its victory during the French and Indian War. Max, Great Britain acquired these islands, but these islands had already been colonized by the French, sometimes by the Spanish, and they'd always been peopled with indigenous peoples. So I wonder if you would talk to us about how the surveys of these ceded islands helped the Board of Trade and the British government figure out how they should incorporate these islands and all of their inhabitants into its empire. That's right. So the Board of Trade had a very clear and simple vision for these new Caribbean islands. Sometimes we think of this moment in the 18th century as a moment when slavery was on the decline, when the rise of abolitionist sentiment was making slave owners defensive. But in fact, from a British imperial perspective, The British Empire was doubling down on African slavery and plantation agriculture in the Caribbean. Thousands and thousands of slaves were imported directly from Africa to work the new sugar fields in these new ceded islands. And the reason why this was so was that it was unclear to Britain that East Florida or West Florida or Nova Scotia would, especially in the short term, ever be profitable populist colonies. This was really a long-term plan to develop those places. But they knew they could sell off plantation lands in Grenada and St. Vincent and the other ceded islands to the highest bidder. They could generate a lot of revenue for the treasury to pay back some of that war debt that Britain was laboring under. And they knew that there was a very clear plan for how these places could be made profitable. They would be sold to sugar planters who would enslave people to work on these islands and produce as much sugar as possible. But as you mentioned, this uniform vision of the ceded islands neglected to really think about what was different about these islands. And there's two islands in particular I'd like to talk about in this regard. One is Grenada, which was the most intensively settled island with French citizens who now became what were called new subjects of the British king. The terms of the Treaty of Paris were very liberal in terms of preserving the rights and privileges of those French citizens. And one of the controversial points for Protestant colonists was the amount of latitude the British government gave French settlers in the new empire, both in Quebec and in places like Grenada. One of the plans that the British had was to make sure that in French-dominated districts in Grenada, there would be French justices of the peace. They set aside positions on the colonial council for French representatives. And Grenada planters from Great Britain almost were in open rebellion over this inclusion of the French as partners in empire. They believed that this new colony was theirs to rule, and they did not want to share it with their former adversaries, the French. So Grenada is a really good test case for seeing how this new vision of a more inclusive empire might work in practice, and how much Protestant settlers in the colonies objected to sharing power and social authority with their former rivals, these new subjects of the king, these French Catholics. In the island of St. Vincent, there was a different problem. There was a sizable population of what the English called Carib Indians. These were descendants of the original inhabitants of the southeastern Caribbean. And a group of inhabitants on the eastern side of the island of St. Vincent were known as the Black Caribs. As legend had it, a group of shipwrecked slaves made their escape and ended up intermarrying with another group of Carib Indians who were known as the Yellow Caribs. And they formed a pretty populous, well-established group on the island of St. Vincent. So when British settlers and officials arrived in St. Vincent and tried to convert their land into plantation tracts, this created a military conflict. Britain had not been that flexible in imagining these islands as different kinds of places. At first, they thought that they might negotiate with the Caribbeans. They might move them 
to another island. In fact, in St. Vincent, the first time I ever have heard of a colonization scheme, that is a scheme to take Africans in the Americas and transport them to the coast of West Africa, that scheme was first advanced to resolve this problem in St. Vincent. So those lands could be cleared for sugar agriculture. In the end of the day, the Black Caribs refused to cede an inch of land to the British. They wanted to maintain their sovereignty. They did not want to negotiate over giving land away. And the British army was mobilized. And so began the first Carib War of 1774. At the end of this war, the Carib Indians were forced to concede and give up part of their territory, but they maintained part of their territory as well. It was a really traumatic event, not only for the Carib Indians, but for British officials who suddenly saw their empire, which had been advertised as being a source for benevolence and rational colonization, engaged in a war of extermination against what many people in Britain regarded as an innocent people and actually subjects of the king who had rights and responsibilities. So the War of St. Vincent in the 1770s gave rise to the first debates over the morality of slavery in the British Parliament. So this moment was really a test case for the vision that Britain had for the empire, and it showed the distance between Britain's plans for development and the realities on the ground that were sometimes unpredictable. It sounds like there was a lot of experimentation in trying to figure out what strategies of colonization and governance worked on paper and what really worked on the ground in the colonies. There really was. And so maps can be very powerful tools for administration. No modern state can really rule without a really developed sense of cartography. But maps can also create the illusion of control when it doesn't, in fact, exist. And I think that's really one of the main points of the book is that, you know, if you are a noble member of the Board of Trade and you are in the Treasury Building in Whitehall, sitting around a beautiful mahogany table, looking at a map of St. Vincent or West Florida or any place in the Americas, the specificity of those maps, their beauty, their rigor, their detail, gives you the sense that you can control what goes on there. And in fact, for most of British American history, the way the empire was governed was really by consensus and negotiation with the settlers who lived there. Britain had this idea that they were better able to govern those colonies. And with these maps, they believed they could do so from a great distance. But there was always a distance between what the maps showed and the realities on the ground. The false sense of confidence these maps gave Britain I think is one of the really undiscussed sources of the American Revolution and one of my book's contributions to a richer understanding of how we got to that conflict. As we said at the beginning, the purpose of all these maps was to help the Board of Trade collect information so that it could fulfill the king's orders to figure out how to better manage the British Empire's colonies and to figure out how to keep the colonies from growing too large, too fast, and too independent of the empire. Max, I have to believe that the British North American colonists had strong opinions about these maps and ideas for better governance. After all, the American Revolution happened. So I wonder if you would talk to us about the role these maps may have played in fomenting the events that we now know make up the American Revolution. So the maps that were made to promote British interests before and during the Seven Years' War never made mention of this idea that after the war, colonists and their range, their ambitions for empire would be constrained by proclamation lines or new rules and regulations for settlement. The maps showed the charter boundaries of the Atlantic colonies extending all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So when Americans fought for Britain during the Seven Years' War, they believed they were fighting for their own right to colonize. And that after the war, after the enormous victories that Britain scored over France and Spain, they would enjoy the fruits of that victory by speculating and developing those Western lands. Today, we often see that as selfishness, greediness, irresponsibility, the role of speculators in particular, historians have highlighted as an indication of kind of capitalists run amok, not being controlled. But from their perspective, they were doing the work of civilization. They thought their greatest historical accomplishment was in settling what they regarded as wilderness and turning it into civil and productive property. And of course, George Washington and many of the founding fathers were among them. So when George Washington heard about the proclamation, he wrote a secret letter he didn't want to publicize to a friend that said, people who don't actually survey these new lands in the West are going to lose the chance to do so in the future. Once that moment is gone, that opportunity won't come again. So he urged his business associates 
to conduct surveys not very publicly because he believed the proclamation line was really going to be a dead letter. Most people in the colonies believe that once Britain kind of lost interest in this initiative, they would be free to do what they had always done, which was to settle and develop the colonies. At the end of the new map of empire, Max states an idea that he told us about a bit earlier, that if we take the time to understand dependence and independence, not just as political ideas, but as geographic ideas, then we can more clearly understand the fears that drove Americans to protest imperial governance during the American Revolution. Max, before we move into the time warp, would you elaborate on this idea and point a bit more? How can we understand dependence and independence as geographic concepts, and how will understanding them in this way add to our understanding of the American Revolution? After the Seven Years' War, when the conflicts between the colonies and Great Britain began, most of the patriot protesters who really criticized the laws that Parliament was passing and the edicts of the king focused on things that they regarded as unconstitutional or illegal. So the Stamp Act is a great example of that. Protesters believe the Stamp Act wasn't legitimate. And so that became the focus of protest in the era before the American Revolution. Nobody disputed the right of the king to dispose these new territories any way he wanted. They were the king's property as far as European colonists in America thought about it. But it left a bad taste in their mouths. This sense that their whole historical accomplishment had been kind of downgraded by the criticisms of the Board of Trade and other people that they were seen as irresponsible and they needed someone to govern over them. And especially that other people who were well-connected with British officials were going to get first dibs on all these new lands. They were going to be privileged to come and claim the spoils of this great war for empire. I think Americans felt shut out of the victory after the Seven Years' War. And if you read the pamphlet literature of the American Revolution closely, as I tried to do in this book, what you'll see is they reference these new lands and this scheme for empire, these new limits, this sense of an empire of people who didn't regard colonists as full citizens, as somehow lesser or inferior. And those things weren't political issues. They were emotional issues. They were cultural issues. And what I think these maps have led us to is a new and fuller understanding of the revolution. And that sense of grievance, that sense of being disregarded came up in full force during the revolution. When Americans wanted to picture what they regarded as their society, they drew new maps. And so I look closely at the maps that John Adams collected when he was secretary of the War Department during the American Revolution. A lot of these maps that he collected as part of the War Department's collection were the same old maps that the British had produced years before, but he read them as an American. And he saw the continental expanse of what would become the United States as really being the future of America. So one way to read the American Revolution is to see Americans rejecting the new map for empire and writing their own. And so in my mind, the first maps that Americans produced after the American Revolution, maps that feature expansive continental spaces, are an answer to the maps that Britain produced before the war. Okay, let's jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the Board of Trade had never ordered its general survey of North America and the Ceded Islands? How would the history of British North America be different? So it's interesting, and many historians have pointed this out before me, that Americans were the most British right at this moment when all the trouble started between Britain and America in the 1760s and 1770s. There was a sharp depression after the Seven Years' War, and there were some conflicts that between colonists and officials even before all the trouble started. But for a large part, people really were celebrating this great victory. They felt a sense of transatlantic Britishness that had never really been there before. And they began consuming British fashions, British ideas, in quantities that they never had before. So America was never more British than right before the American Revolution. This was a prosperous time for colonists, even if it was a scary time for Africans enslaved to produce all that wealth and Indians who lived on the frontiers of this expanding empire. And so I have to believe that without the pressure that British officials under the Grenville administration 
promoting ideas that were conceived by the Board of Trade. And there were many British commentators, Edmund Burke among them, who really believed that it was better to leave this organic system that had evolved over decades, where the colonists were largely responsible for their own affairs, where Britain was really responsible sort of as an umpire to make sure the empire as a whole ran well and fairly, that that inherited method of governance was really the right way to govern America and could have governed America for a long time. If these idealistic reformers on the board of trade hadn't picked up their quill pens and started dreaming of a new perfected empire. So there was always a contingent within Great Britain who believed that this was a controversy that never needed to happen, that it could have been negotiated before the conflict got out of control. On the other hand, most Americans and most British thinkers also believed that colonies couldn't be dependent forever, especially as they grew in population, in civility, in culture, and in size. That there was something natural about colonies leaving a state of dependence, just as children left a state of immaturity to become adults themselves. And in fact, this is the most common metaphor that was used in all the political pamphlets on one side or another, that Britain was like a parent and American colonies were like children. So from the British perspective, it was asked, what kind of respect do the children owe their parents? And from an American perspective, the question was always posed as, when are children allowed to grow up and enter the world on their own terms as competent, independent individuals? So I think in the fullness of time, most commentators on both sides understood that America was going to be independent from Great Britain, but that didn't have to happen necessarily in a war for independence. The British Commonwealth poses a different model. The history of Canada poses a different model for how a former colony could reach a state of independence, but still be connected to the larger imperial polity. Max, earlier you told us a bit about Map Scholar the software you help create to work with maps. And I wonder if you would tell us a bit more about this software. Is this a tool that any of us who just love maps but don't specifically study them might find useful and fun? Yeah, so we got a lot of funding over years from the federal government. And part of accepting a National Endowment for the Humanities grant means that whatever you produce has to be open source and anyone can use it and it's free for anyone to use. So although I helped design and build Map Scholar for my own purposes, we really want other people to use this resource as well. So you can find out everything you need to know about Map Scholar by going to mapscholar.org. All of the websites that support the book are there. They're free to use. All you need to do is open them in a browser. You don't have to download any software. You do have to be connected to the internet to use this resource. And there are featured atlases on mapscholar.org that show mostly my work that focuses on early America. But also, I'm teaching a course at University of Virginia called Maps and World History. We've created an online digital atlas of all of those maps for use by my students and anyone else who cares to look at it. Scholars here at the University of Virginia have developed websites on 18th century literature, on the geography of concentration camps, on the cartography of Los Angeles. So if you have maps that you would like to visualize, Map Scholar is really designed to be a very user-friendly, completely free, and very robust and durable online platform for doing that. There are a lot of instructions at mapscholar.org on how to start. And if you find that it's something that is useful for you, you should contact me directly and I'd be happy to help you get a Map Scholar site up and run. And it sounds like even if we don't want to create a site, if we're just into looking at maps, we can go to mapscholar.org and just fulfill our need to look at all the cool maps it has online. Yeah, the purpose of Map Scholar is to really give scholars and others a chance to visualize their ideas using this old cartography. You know, libraries around the world are spending millions and millions of dollars to digitize their collections, to preserve them and make them accessible. So you can go to the Library of Congress's American Memory site or the David Rumsey Historical Map Collection or the image archives of the John Carter Brown Library and many other places and view their collections of online maps. What Map Scholar does is it allows people who have something to say about those maps to put those maps up, to add text and other resources to zoom in on details, and to create a kind of digital atlas that you can flip through and view the maps and see new things in them. So I would encourage anyone who's interested to not only look at all of the maps for the book are available for free at mapscholar.org slash empire. And you can look at those. They're heavily annotated, so you can read about a lot of the ideas and people I've talked about today. And I encourage people who are interested in this to learn more about it. It's really a remarkable moment when all of this new content, all of these old maps are suddenly available 
And there's all these great software tools to do something with them. So I think Map Scholar is one example of that. So aside from your work on Map Scholar, what aspect of history are you researching now? Does it involve any maps? It will involve maps. I think once you get bitten by the map bug, it's hard not to keep focusing on maps. I'm starting a new book project on the geography of colonization as it focuses on early American rivers. One of the ideas that really stuck with me from my graduate school days was in a book by the historical geographer D.W. Meinig. It's called The Shaping of America. And one of the things he said was that in the early days, in the 17th century of English America, although maps showed huge sovereignty claims across the continent, in reality, British America was just a series of outposts, usually at the mouths of rivers. And as those settlements grew, they really grew along the banks of those rivers. So I found that that was a view of America that few people had really talked about. But there's an enormous amount of scholarship that historical geographers have produced over the years, I think a lot of which doesn't get the attention it deserves. So my goal in this new project is to write a new history of early America that summarizes all of this literature and that investigates the history of exploring, developing, fighting, and living along the rivers of early North America. I've also become really interested in indigenous map making. Of course, I talk about this in my book. I talk about North American Indians and the maps they made and the maps they helped negotiate. But I've started teaching at the University of Virginia about indigenous cartography more broadly all over the world. And so not only am I developing new digital resources to compare how native peoples throughout the world and throughout history created maps, but I'm building a new digital platform to show those maps as well. And I hope someday that will be a book called Mapping Indigenous World. How can we contact you if we have questions about something we talked about today? People who are interested should feel free to email me directly. My email address is edelson at virginia.edu. And you can find information about my work on mapscholar.org and at my faculty webpage at the University of Virginia History Department website. Max Edelson, thank you for joining us and for taking us through the new map of the British Empire. Thank you, Liz. It's been a pleasure. Surveys and the maps they create can be powerful tools for administration. As Max revealed, no modern state can really rule without a developed sense of cartography. Maps facilitate nations and empires. They help people see how nations and empires can transcend their own localities. And when combined with survey data and observations of the land and people who inhabit a mapped area, they allow government officials to determine how they might best organize and govern areas far away from their own locality. Now, for all of these reasons, the Board of Trade responded to King George III's order to come up with a plan for the better management and governance of Great Britain's North American colonies, with a plan to survey and map those colonies with as much detail as possible. So, the Board of Trade's General Survey of North America was a huge undertaking. It created two survey districts, North and South, and employed many men to undertake the job of surveying the colonies. As Max noted, using the techniques of plain table surveying, surveyors could only survey about seven miles of coastline per day. Now, we'll never know exactly how many maps came out of the general survey, because the detailed maps it produced were scattered into different archives and private collections over the years. But thanks to Max's hard work, we can see 257 of these maps online in Map Scholar. Now, regardless of how many maps came out of the survey, it's clear that they played a role in fomenting the American Revolution. The survey's maps and data were used to inform the Board of Trade's recommendations to King and Parliament about how best to manage and govern the Empire's North American colonies. They were also used to create a vision for the future of the Empire, which many colonists in North America disagreed with. The Board of Trade and other British officials imagined a limited and slow expansion of its colonies, which it hoped to manage in such a way that made the colonies more dependent upon the empire. In turn, British Americans imagined a fast-expanding vast empire that would one day take over the whole of the North American continent and eventually become independent of, or at least less dependent on, Great Britain. So how did Great Britain and its colonists reconcile these differences? They quarreled in a revolution and war that eventually saw 13 colonies leave the empire for an independent existence. It was an existence that allowed both Great Britain and its former colonists to pursue the visions of empire they most agreed with. Look for more information about Max, his book, The New Map of Empire, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 180.
six. The Omohundro Institute has published award-winning books since 1943, and one of their most recent publications is Molly Warsh's American Baroque. To discover more about pearls and how they impacted the development of early American and world trade between 1492 and 1700, be sure to visit benfranklinsworld.com slash pearls. And don't forget to use the promo code at the top of the page if you like what you see so you can save 40%. Again, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash pearls to learn more. Finally, what do you think of the idea that governments use maps to govern? Can you think of ways that governments use maps today? These questions just occurred to me, and I need to think through my answers too. So send me an email and we can chat about ideas together. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember... Never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.